Welcome to Supply Chain Partners TV and podcast, where we discuss innovative solutions delivered by our members at Supply Chain Partners. Our members can help you to build a high-performing business and supply chain. I'm Dr. Sharon Grant, the founder of Supply Chain Partners. I've worked in the logistics and supply chain management field for over 20 years, and I specialize in strategic supply chain performance management. Let's now introduce you to our member. With us today is Peter Jones, the Managing Director and Founder of Prological. Prological is a leading Australasian supply chain consulting firm specialising in end-to-end strategic supply chain and business transformation. Their team of expert consultants can help you to make your supply chain your unfair advantage. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Sharon, for having me. It's great to be here. Today's episode is about automation and warehousing considerations in network design. We're tackling three big strategic management areas that keep senior managers awake at night when trying to design the most efficient and effective supply chain network and operations that will achieve the goals of all stakeholders. Peter, what are some of the most common mistakes you see when reviewing existing supply chain network design? Look, that is the burning question for all supply chain executives at the moment. As we all know, the world has been through some very significant disruption in recent years, of which COVID has now emerged as just one element. And as a result of that, the way in which global and domestic supply chains operated pre-2019, pre-2020 has significantly shifted. And supply chain managers have now been tasked with repositioning their businesses and the way that they operate to meet these new challenges. And part of that challenge at the moment is we're not quite sure where this is all going to land, but we do know that it's going to take a few more years till there is clarity. So that broad context provides quite a difficult environment for supply chain executives and businesses for making medium and long-term decisions. Nonetheless, that is the reality of the circumstance that we have. So the common mistakes that we see happening are, one is not enough attention is given to those current realities. And the way to provide those with attention is not necessarily to specifically focus in the first instance on what the supply chain strategy needs to be, albeit it may be broken or damaged or performing less than optimally. But the first key is to understand what is the business's response and approach to this changing environment? And how is the business projecting its forward forecasts and the way in which it wants to operate with its customers into the future. Once that is understood, then the supply chain team has half a chance of designing an appropriate solution to meet those business objectives, taking the view that really supply chain is a servant to the business strategy. It is the means by which the business strategy gets executed in the fulfillment component of the business. So the first most common mistake we see is the movement too fast, too rapid, and in too much isolation of supply chain strategy without that integrated approach with the business strategy first. The next two most common mistakes we see are in one, the procurement process, and two, the execution of whatever the program of work that gets procured is. I'll start with the procurement process. Supply chain is getting more and more complicated and the the degree of knowledge within the varying verticals of supply chain in order to be able to run at the pointy end of the field is becoming more and more specific. And it's very, very difficult for even supply chain managers within a business to become a subject matter expert across warehouse management systems, forecasting systems, inventory control systems, warehouse operations, the latest in operations, international freight, international trade, domestic freight. Now, most senior executive supply chain managers will have a core competency in one or maybe two of all of these areas. But to actually get your supply chain running right across all of these areas requires a very high degree of expertise across them. Since the global financial crisis, procurement's taken a much, much greater focus role within supply chain procurement. But at the same time, and particularly in recent times, the degree of expertise required has increased exponentially. And so within that, there's become a bit of a disconnect between the capacity and capability of those quite often leading a market engagement with the degree of expertise and understanding that is required to get an optimum outcome. And that is not to suggest that through these recent traditional processes, there's not an improved position made, but quite often 
there are big gaps left because of the expertise not being brought in on the design side of things. An outcome of this could quite easily be, and today this has become very real within an Australian context, businesses moving into assets with a value of $150 million between, you know, 100,000 square metres of land and a 50,000 square metre warehouse. But within that now, with automation, they could easily be spending that much money again. So you easily can get to a $300 million asset. Bringing external expertise, so you have that expertise in all of the vertical requirements for a few hundred thousand dollars at the front end and therefore increasing your probability of getting an optimum outcome is very, very worthwhile. But it's often a shortcut that gets taken at the beginning, which leads to suboptimal outcomes relative to what was possible. That's the first thing that we quite often see. And a lot of the work that we do is then coming in when these projects get delivered and they're not delivering what was intended or promised. And we actually find out that it goes all the way back to the specification that was documented in the very first instance. The other big mistake that we see is obviously these are big programs of work and they are very expensive and they become cash intensive. And it's not unsurprising or nor uncommon that they run over budget toward the end. And so what we often also see is that that budget tension towards the end of these projects starts then chopping off things that are seen as optional. We can do that later. Let's not outsource that and we bring it in-house. But as a result of that, we quite often see almost defeat clutched from the jaws of victory many times where we see a $25 million asset employed and they decided at the end of the program of work that they would chop a $2 million addition off that, a sorting machine, a feeding machine, a staging piece of equipment that helps the $25 million asset work much more efficiently. And so they chop that $2 million off and then what they do is they throw 10 people at the task that those $2 million was going to do as a no people requirement asset. So they've added a million dollars per annum to their operating cost and the $25 million asset doesn't work near as efficiently as what it might otherwise have done. And so again, we and we see this mistake often, the other big mistake we see in implementation is training on these big programs of work is absolutely critical to get the most out of these investments. And it becomes another area where businesses will often chop the external training off at the end. And that again then leads to either suboptimal implementation and commissioning of systems or conversely, long ramp up times to get the efficiency out of it which also has a significant cost. So I guess they're the three main things that we see is not fully appreciating the business strategy and how it's responding and then lining that supply chain strategy up with the business strategy. Secondly is the exponential complication that is being brought to supply chain design at the network level and then within the infrastructure elements to it is at a level now that very, very few businesses will have the internal expertise to be at the pointy end of the field in all of those disciplines. And then the third thing is to really work hard to maintain your budget and then err towards expanding that budget as necessary. But we really, really advise don't go cutting off things in the original design because the consequences of that, as we observe, last four years and end up costing multiples of what you saved by chopping the budget before you finished your implementation. Thanks, Peter. You have identified many significant issues that need to be considered. So Peter, how does a poorly designed supply chain network impact the organization and its suppliers and customers? Over the last 10 or 15 years, supply chain has increasingly become either a distinctive competency or a distinctive liability within businesses. And as time goes on, those that have developed that distinctive competency by having really good network design and then application and implementation of that good design will continue to be able to operate at more and more efficient levels. On the other end of the spectrum, those with a poorly designed network and poorly designed infrastructure potentially misaligned to the business strategy, those businesses are going to find themselves further and further behind. One of the sayings that we often use is for businesses, if you're doing tomorrow what you were doing yesterday, then you're probably going backwards. And within supply chain development, that is so true. So when you have two competing organizations within one market space, and one of them has a good network and good infrastructure and high operational performance, and the other one has something that is less than that, then over time, the better performing business from a supply chain perspective will be increasing market 
market share. They've given their sales team a tool that the other company is not able to compete with because of the basic underlying infrastructure that is sitting behind them, either mismatched to the business strategy or inefficient and therefore loading up that cost to serve equation because they've got a higher cost to serve through their supply chain. So it is absolutely material. And at the moment we see, because of the rapid transformation happening in supply chains at present, for those that are on the no longer bleeding edge, but jump on what is still a leading edge to next generation network design and next generation warehouse design, that opportunity to have that distinctive competency and build market share improvement as a result of supply chain performance is very, very real. Now, within a decade, all of those still standing, we'll all get back to a reasonably level playing field. But even when they're at a level playing field, the ones who were on the leading edge will have captured the market share. So what has your competitor that was slower to the new game got to offer to win that market share back? And that will be their challenge. And we call those on the leading edge, those that take the early adoption, they're the ones creating what we call the unfair advantage which is what their competitors will be saying when they walk into their commercial meetings and their senior executive meetings. Why is X company continuing to beat us in tenders? The answer boils down to they have an unfair advantage. Their supply chain network is so much superior to ours. They've got these tools within their warehouse capability. They've got this infrastructure inside their warehouses. They have these systems to integrate customer service and order receipt all the way through to order fulfillment. We don't have those. Whatever the story is, the competitor with the weaker position is behind the eight ball and the competitor with the stronger position has the unfair advantage from the weaker perspective. Thanks, Peter. Let's now talk about automation. We know that the use of automation in logistics and supply chain operations is accelerating at a rapid pace and is getting increasingly complex. Peter, what are some of the most common mistakes you see that organizations make about their approach to automation? That's a really good question, Sharon. We see a number of common mistakes that are made. The first thing is a business needs to be automation ready. And there's a digital element to that. And there's a personnel element to that. The second big mistake is not fully understanding what you actually need. And when you approach this process from that position, you really leave yourself exposed to some of the best salespeople in the world. These people are selling very sophisticated, expensive systems off big global platforms. They are very, very good at their job and selling what they have. Even when they come into your business, they may well know that another company has a better solution or a better part solution to to your problem than what they can provide. But they are not going to tell you that. They are going to sell you their system and they are going to show you how your system will give you an improved position from where you are, which will nearly always be true, but it may not necessarily have been the best system that you could get. So therefore, to get somebody involved in the process that is impartial to all of the varying vendors and can bring a more metered and objective evidence-based process to your automation selection, will really help your business significantly get the selection of what you need correct. And then we engage all of the vendors and put together an appropriate solution for you. We see this quite often where we walk into warehouses that have been early adopters. The processes have been done internally. Yes, they improved from where they were, but they still might be running 30 or 40% away from where they could have been had they got external expertise to come in and help them understand what can the automation industry provide for you, including how to integrate potentially different components as against what might each of the different vendors be able to bring as a package. So we see that as a significant issue at the moment. Thanks, Peter. There's definitely a lot to consider before going ahead with automation. Let's now talk about warehousing considerations. Now, warehousing can affect every aspect of a company's operations. Peter, what are some of the most common mistakes you see when reviewing existing warehousing strategies? That's a really good question. And I'm going to focus on the existing warehouse strategies that a business may have in either operating their brownfields facility, existing operation with a history, and the second will be greenfields. So looking at what that strategy might look like going forward, hopefully a 
aligned to the business strategy. Within a brownfields facility, what we quite often see is that businesses, as they evolve, grow and change, don't go back and re-engineer their warehouse. We have a great story, which is the ant to elephant story. A lot of people may not know, but the ant is actually the most powerful creature on the earth in terms of power to weight ratio and also speed. If I were an ant, had the capability, I would be able to lift five ton. And with that five ton in the air, I could run 80 kilometers an hour. It's quite an impressive little piece of engineering. What we see happens with a lot of businesses is when they move into a new warehouse 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they were that ant, powerful and nimble with their new shiny toy, hopefully well laid out with the latest and greatest at that particular time. But then the business changes, the skew range changes, profile of some product changes, the pick profile changes, some whole ranges go, new ranges come in. And what they do is they evolve the warehouse with this. And so what happens is our little ant gets bigger, but it maintains its exoskeleton. And for successful businesses, the ant with the exoskeleton evolves into something the size of an elephant, which no longer works. Ants do not scale to an elephant with strength or speed. The exoskeleton just cracks and crumbles under the weight which it's carrying. Somewhere in that evolutionary process, it needed to get re-engineered so that it had an internal skeleton like a real elephant, which can deal with the big job, the one that has evolved. And what we see is that the most common mistake is businesses do not go back and re-engineer their warehouse, but they allow that nimble, powerful ant that they started with to evolve into a straining ant the size of an elephant and wonder why day in, day out, there's noise around numerous areas of their operation. So that going back and re-engineering things is probably the most common mistake we see is that that process doesn't happen. If they move warehouses, they'd all understand that's what we have to do. No questions asked. Quite often, if only they would re-engineer in their own environment, they maybe wouldn't have to move warehouses. And then from a greenfield perspective, we're in a transition point right at the moment of warehouse design. And I'll use the analogy of our motor cars. If we jump into a 1970 car, it has a steering wheel and brakes. It has an entertainment system. It has a HVAC system with a fan, maybe an air conditioner, certainly a heater. If we jump into a 2022 car, it ticks exactly those same boxes. There's actually not too many boxes that are in a 2022 car at that level that were not in our 1970s car. But to look at the two and to engage with the two and the efficiency of the two is a million miles apart. Because in the 1970s vehicle, it was quite obvious that all of these bits had been engineered on, not engineered in. They were on top of the first design. So they designed the dashboard and then they say, where are we gonna cut the hole to put the radio? In a 2022 car, you don't even see where the radio is. You've got some buttons on your steering wheel and a touch screen. The radio is sitting somewhere integrated into the design of the car. And that all leads to a much more cost-effective piece of equipment to manufacture, a much more cost-effective piece of equipment for you to buy, and a much more efficient and pleasant experience. We're at a cusp of warehouse design changing at that sort of scale. We're moving forward because of some of the things we've talked about, digitization and automation, warehouse design now needs to become integrated where the automation is not put into the four walls that are designed, but the two things are designed through an iterative process to come up with an integrated design. And then you end up with a 2022 looking warehouse not a 1975 looking warehouse, which is the traditional process of find the land, work out how big a building we can put on the land, and then get the MHE people to come in and design how to get what we want inside the building that we've got. We're saying, no, it has to happen from the other way around, is you design the task on the inside first, put the building envelope around it, and then have an iterative process to finesse that design so the two become integrated. And we've now got case studies and research that shows the enormous capital saving that can be achieved through this process 
which then manifests itself in very significant rent reductions moving forward for the client, as well as providing them with a much, much better piece of equipment. Exactly the same story as our car. Cheaper to make, cheaper to buy, and a much more pleasant experience to use. But again, it requires forethought and it requires that work to be done up front. To this level, we're saying to people, sign nothing until you have designed everything. Thanks, Peter. You've provided excellent analogies. So how does an organization's automation strategy and warehousing strategy impact the design of their supply chain network? Ultimately, Sharon, a supply chain network is designed in order to meet customers' service expectations and the promise that a business makes in terms of order fulfillment. So when we bring that back to the automation and warehousing strategy, the more effective and efficient your warehouse design is and integrated with that is automation, the faster you can process orders. And being able to process orders faster brings advantage to a business like potentially order cutoff times. So if we go into a retail environment, or an automotive environment or any parts environment for that matter, order cutoff time at the end of the day is absolutely critical. There's not a car dealership in the country that would not love to be able to have an order cutoff time at about 5.36 p.m. because at that time of the afternoon, they know every part they need for tomorrow and then be able to place that order at 5.36 p.m. and know that those parts will be in their dealership tomorrow morning by 6 o'clock, 6.30. So when they start work, they don't have cars sitting in bays or on hoist waiting waiting for parts to turn up. So if you have an automation piece in place, you all of a sudden have potentially the ability to pick two or 3,000 lines an hour with 10 or 15 people. Without an automation strategy, that's just not possible. So for the business without automation, they may have to have a 3 p.m. order cutoff time. From the dealer's perspective, they learned to live with that in the past. But what is going to happen over the next five years or so, some businesses in that sector are going to be able to go to the 5 p.m., 6 p.m. order cutoff times. So for businesses with the 3 p.m. order cutoff time, they're at a distinct disadvantage and their people will be saying they've got an unfair advantage because of what they're able to do. The automation and the warehouse strategy integration element just all the more harnesses that. And then it's the combination of those two things placed in the correct geography so that you can really lean into that customer service promise that you want to make or be able to better fulfill the ambition of your customers, which 15 years ago, we might have said, you're living with the fairies, but because of modern technology and smart design, today might be achievable, they're the impacts that these things are having in building that distinctive competency and that then being able to create market share. So they're critical moving forward. And as I said right at the start, I think in a decade from now, most businesses will be with advanced systems. It's just a case of how much market share did they lose by coming to the party late or how much market share did they win by getting on board early and getting on the leading edge of this transition that we're seeing play out before us. Thanks, Peter. I'm keen to understand how Prological has helped your clients to design efficient and effective supply chain networks. Could you please provide a real life example of how Prological has helped one of your clients with network design, automation and warehousing? Yeah, I'd, I would love to do that. It would be great to have a couple of hours because we have a number of great stories, but I will keep it to one. We had a client come to us around about 15 months ago and their business had been through 20% plus compounding growth over the last three or four years, a business about 12 years old within an Australian context. And that business had got to the stage where on a busy day, they had around about a quarter of a million picks per day to do out of one centralized warehouse. That represented a little bit over 100,000 orders a day. And that company had some automation in their facility, which a previous generation of management had put in. And it was one of those cases where they had got a right strategy put in place, but they they ran out of budget and took a few shortcuts at the end and are still paying for that today. And we're working with them to help optimize what they've got and introduce some new technology there. So this business had grown exponentially. They were in a facility that was never, ever dreamt of processing that volume of product. So they came to us early on in this realization that they needed a different tomorrow to the one that they had going where they were. So what might the business look like from about 2026 moving forward? So we had to then 
take their business forecast and work out pre-2019 what their growth was. Then during the COVID period, which it was 20% plus year on year growth, which of these two things was normative going forward? And then even since that time, we now have global saber rattling of a bit of a recession coming. So that impact comes as well. All of that feeds into what is the business strategy looking like? Because that's what we were trying to design the network automation and warehousing solution to fit. So within that, we had to firstly, it needs to be agile. It needs to be flexible. And we need to remove any single point failures. And an example of a single point failure may have been to take their 20% year on year growth and run that out for six or seven years and say, well, that's what the volume is going to be. So let's build infrastructure to deal with that. And then all of a sudden, their growth curve slows significantly. It comes down to single digits, let's say. They no longer have the revenue to support the operational expenditure of the facility that we've designed. On the other side of things, what if we build it too small? And like what happened when COVID hit, you know, everything does stop for a little while. But let's say next March, for whatever reason, all of the sabre rattling turns out to have been, you know, not quite as bad as everyone thought it would, and it all takes off again. And we've just gone and designed all of this new infrastructure for you. And already it's looking like it's insufficient for where the business is going. So the first thing is you've got to work out how to deal with these particular scenarios. Once that solution is given consideration, and that there are agreed strategies to deal with both an overachievement against business strategy as well as an underachievement against business strategy. We say, right, we've got a plus 20%, minus 20%. We can't see it getting out of side those boundaries. That's okay, let's proceed. Then it's about working out, Rodeo, in 2026 or 2027, we know we're going to have all of these bright, shiny new toys. Then you come back and you say, how do we get the business from here to there without compromising the growth that is needed to fund the brightening shot new toys that we're going to have in 2026, 2027. So then there becomes a period of time where you've got to chew gum and walk at the same time. You are both optimizing and driving efficiency out of the old toy that you recognized already is struggling the ant that's become the elephant. And at the same time, you're re-engineering your new elephant, but it's not quite finished its gestation period yet and not quite free to run in front of the business for you. So there becomes a period of time where you're actually doing two things, designing, planning, working on the future, at the same time, ensuring that business growth continues so that when you move in, you can do what you need to do. Within all of that, obviously, there are business cases to be built. And this is where inventory profile becomes so important. So you can get that automation, materials handling specification correct. Then for us, it's working with the architects and the engineers and the warehouse designers in an iterative process. We've got warehouses designers in our team that have been winning awards in Australia for 20 years. And two years ago, when I introduced them to the process of working with the architects who in turn work with the engineers, our award-winning warehouse designers have said, there is no way in the world I would have ever designed what we have designed on my own. And we were able to take it to the new level because of the cross-fertilization of these three disciplines. So that's become the critical element. It's not just about inside-out design standalone idea, you know, designing your materials handling internal and build a box over the top to keep the rain off. The two actually become integrated, but to do the integration requires the engineering. And we've been able to apply some fairly clever engineering solutions to some of the traditional problems with the warehouse designs that we are now working with. So it's working through all of these things that we've been able to do. And at the end of the day, this client now has a very, very clear picture of what their future needs to look like and moving in that particular direction. And at the same time, they also have a very clear pathway of what needs to happen inside their existing operation to get from today with their exoskeleton evolved ant whilst they're building their new engineered elephant. Thanks, Peter. That's an excellent example. Were there any key lessons learned during this project that could help your future clients? Look, that's a great question, Sharon, and there are many lessons that were learnt. The key lesson learnt for our client was the criticality of that digital element. The data has to be very, very good. And whilst we all knew that and they understood it and believed that their data was good, the degree to which good was was at a level that they had not anticipated. So moving forward, we will continue to help our clients to work on that and get it prepared so that they are better ready to move on the automation pathway. 
Thanks, Peter. That's a great lesson. I'd like to delve a bit further into understanding how ProLogical approach supply chain network design. Peter, what are all the variables that senior managers need to consider when they're designing their supply chain network? Thanks, Sharon. That's a great question. And again, we could probably speak all day about this. Indeed, I could write a book, <laughs> but we'll keep it tight. There are three key variables within your supply chain capability that spin the dial on the cost and complexity. The first one is your infrastructure driven by geography. So how many nodes within your network, where are they and what do they do? The second one is then the more nodes that you have, the more inventory that you carry. But also the more nodes you have, the more product you have close to your customer. So the third element then becomes your freight cost. So obviously when you have more nodes, your last mile freight cost is much, much lower. When you have less nodes, your last mile can be in an Australian context, four or 5,000 kilometers for your last mile. So those are your three key variables, your warehouse and infrastructure cost, holistically, labor, all of the equipment, et cetera. The second one is then the inventory implications on that. And then the third one is what are the freight cost variances on that? In all of the network studies we've ever done within Australia, what we find out is that more often than not, the cost variation across those three variables is not significant enough to actually be making the decision as to what network configuration you should have. So the variables then invariably come back to looking at risk profile, removing single node failures. So if I run one national DC and the power goes down on the grid, I have a single point failure. If I have a data failure in a single point, if there's industrial action within a state, which happens to be where my warehouse is, these are considerations that have always been present and people talked about, but state lockdowns and COVID has brought that to a whole new level. And businesses are saying, we want to de-risk from those sorts of shutdowns. So this has become a new variable around risk. Another variable that's coming into play is that around emissions. Without question, a decentralized network is much, much more sensitive and compliant with reductions in CO2. To move large volumes of freight by sea, by rail, by the largest vehicle you can get a hold of, the long distance, and then using small efficient vehicles doing the last mile has a significantly lower environmental impact than doing last mile deliveries over long distances. So as businesses now start chasing the carbon reductions that they've committed to, decentralizations of networks is going to come into play, but it will come into conflict with the complexity that that brings to inventory. And it'll bring in conflict, the complexity of more infrastructure structure costs, but it will come with the benefit of lower domestic transport costs. So these are all of the variables that are held in tension. We talk about in a supply chain context, there are no perfect supply chains. The key is understanding all of your elements and then proactively choosing your compromises so that they do not compromise the business strategy. Thanks, Peter. Designing a supply chain network is definitely a complex process. Could you please explain how your dynamic network modeling approach works? Look, that would be a pleasure. The first thing, and as I've mentioned quite a few times, is understand what the business strategy is and what that future picture looks like. That's the first thing to do. Then take the data that we can get a hold of and project that forward across what the business projections are looking like. And that gives us a baseline to design to. And then we work out the probabilities of that being above what our projections are suggesting and the probabilities of it being below those suggestions. And we work out what the degree of tolerance the business thinks is probable. We're working in an agricultural business. We look at the seasonal cycles. You know, how often do droughts occur? If there's droughts for three years, what happens? If we have rains at the perfect time of the year for three years in a row, what happens? Those are the things that might determine the variables there. For example, once we have that picture in place, then we actually design the network what we say is perfect world, almost unconstrained. And that will take into account the import to local manufacturing proportions, the existing network that they have, overlays with the supplier network that they will need to employ and what those networks look like. So we'll take all of that into consideration and we define perfect world. Then when we've defined perfect world, we apply constraint theory and say, what are the things that are gonna stop us from getting to perfect world? And we start putting those in into the model, which then starts bringing us back to real world. What is this going to look like? 
So perfect world might, for example, have us having a DC that is a long, long way from the transport networks that required because of the particular type of product that we have. So the constraint, because a perfect world says, put the facility here, real world says, if we have the facility there, our transport's not going to work because we're too disconnected from that supplier network that we need. So that constraint theory comes into play. An iterative process around that with the client ends up saying, this is what the network needs to look like from a physical perspective. Then quite often the next question comes is, should we be running that network or should we have three PLs running that network? So then that question gets asked, but we're then asking the question of that question against a network that we know is going to meet our business requirements. So now we're looking for a 3PL to perform and fulfill our business requirements in what we have decided as a business is an optimum outcome, rather than taking our business as it is without understanding what optimum looks like and going out there and giving it to the 3P world to tender on and then just taking the best of those options that come back without actually knowing how far away that might actually be from optimum, because we've just optimized a very, very small set of options that are available to us. Once that's sorted out, then we can work out what our personnel needs to look like. So obviously, if we're insourcing, then our organizational structure needs to look one particular way. If we're insourcing and outsourcing a combined strategy, then we need a different sort of organizational structure. And if we're going to outsource the whole lot, then it's a third macro picture again. We see that happening on the end. So quite often businesses come to us and they're thinking about potentially outsourcing, but they want to start with what their organisational structure should look like. And we're sort of saying, well, can't really define your organisational structure unless until we know what that organisation is actually going to be managing because the options are too broad and require potentially very, very different skill sets. Sitting within this, of course, we do all of the financial modelling from the baseline. We do very extensive freight modelling, and we have learned in an Australian context particularly, the big international modelling software systems, they just do not do Australian freight very well at all. And freight generally becomes the biggest swinger of the dial in terms of if you want to decentralise, that's where we're looking to pick up our cost benefit against our increased inventory and increased infrastructure cost. So unless we get that freight modelling right, we potentially are going to knock out our option because the other two things end up being too cost effective. But we've overestimated the cost of the freight because the modelling tool didn't actually apply what is possible appropriately. It's too difficult. At the same time, we do do our modelling in very, very well-developed Excel files. And we use a tool called Tableau. And we've got some fairly sophisticated development work that we've done in the background to that, which uh, allows us to do modelling, but it is unconstrained in the inputs that we can provide, which allows us to actually produce engineered solutions using the Australian transport industry as our tool rather than using the solution as presented by the transport company. So it's the combination of these elements. Start with the business plan. Work out the perfect world. Apply constraint theory to bring that back to reality. Then make the determination of insourcing or outsourcing or the combination. Then put our organisational structure across the top of that and then work with our client to execute. We do all of this with an evidence-based process such that we would hope that if our client wanted a peer review of the work that we did, they could start from scratch using our data or get a fresh set of data and using the logic that we worked to develop with our client, they would come up with exactly the same answer. And the transparency we tried to provide is such that non-supply chain people can also follow the narrative of the story and the logic of the commercials and the service outcomes. Thanks, Peter. That's a comprehensive approach to network design. Let's now discuss how Prological helps its clients with automation. So if an organization believes they need to invest in automation, what should they consider before they invest? And how does Prological help them through this assessment? The first thing we will talk to them about is the ambition of the business and what does it want to achieve? And then secondly to that, we'll talk to them about getting the organization automation ready. Data and people, those two elements. Now, thankfully at the moment in the world, an automation pathway will take about two years to execute because other than AMRs, that is pretty close to the lead time required at the moment from when a specification is presented and ordered through a purchase order 
to when you can reasonably expect it to be delivered and implemented and running. So again, there's an opportunity here to walk and chew gum from the client's perspective. So if they're not automation ready, but go on the pathway, we can go on both the design process with the automation and get them automation ready in parallel. And hopefully those two things come together at a nexus point around about two years down the track in the current environment. Sitting underneath that is there are so many automation options available and so many vendors out there. And as I mentioned earlier, these vendors have got the best salespeople in the world. And unlike a lot of other industries within this area, they're also technically astute. They can talk the talk. They do know what they're talking about. And so within a presentation environment, they put together a very, very compelling stories. And as mentioned earlier, almost always what they're saying will deliver you a better outcome than the one that you have. But the key moving forward is the ability to stitch together solutions for your business that actually is optimised by drawing different systems from different vendors. And that is very, very difficult to do in listening to the vendor story. And that's where ProLogical can come into play. We understand all of those vendors based on our experience and the exposure we have. We actually do know what they're good at and what they're not good at. And they are all exceptional at something and they are all very ordinary at other things. They are never going to tell you what they're ordinary at. They will only talk about the exceptional. What we can, however, do is we do understand all of those things. So we can see when you look at system A, the benefits that it will bring, which I'm sure you'll understand, but we can also talk about, but here are the compromises that going with that vendor solution holistically will bring. However, if we looked at this other vendor with this other piece of equipment as well, knowing that in today's world, integration of these systems is actually quite simple to do, then a much more optimal type of solution can be brought about. So these are the sorts of considerations that can be had but the first one is very, very difficult from inside the four walls of a business to have all of the expertise required to both take a business that is not automation ready fully on that pathway, whilst at the same time getting a specification correct and then being able to understand all of the information that you gather and be able to unstitch that and then reconstruct it into what is actually the best solution for your business. So that small investment upfront by getting a really well-designed solution that may involve more than one vendor, but will serve your business very, very well for a long time to come is a really worthwhile thing. And that is probably the best part of value we can add to the client's journey. Preparation for automation and making sure that they get that decision correct. Remembering these things will always be many millions of dollars, often tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. To invest a few months up front and a very, very small proportion of that ultimate expenditure to make sure you get it right is smart business in the complexity of today's world. We recently released a new white paper called A Guide to Operational Excellence five steps to explore before making your automation investment. These five steps are the elements that we believe are critical in order to get automation ready. I've mentioned those as we've discussed this today, but a very, very easy way to crib on what that pathway might look like for your organization is to jump on the ProLogical website, find that white paper and have a quick explore of the things that we have shared. Thanks, Peter. That's excellent. And the white paper you mentioned is brilliant. Let's now discuss warehousing. Could you please explain how ProLogical helps its clients with warehousing? There are two key ways in which we do this. One is optimization of what they currently have. And the other is obviously to help them strategically look into their future and for either moving into new brownfields or greenfields environments. The key thing that we're trying to do here is, again, optimize the supply chain's capability to support the business's objectives. A great story is a couple of years ago, a client in Queensland who we'd already completed a number of projects for across about 15 years, 17 years, came to us again. The business had determined that it had outgrown its large parts warehouse in uh, southwestern Brisbane. The president of the company looking after Australia New Zealand operations, however, decided before he went and signed off on his multi-million dollar capex that he had approval for to go and get a new facility because they'd outgrown the current one, that they would just get somebody to come in and have a last look at the current one to make sure that there wasn't more life that could come out of that particular facility. 
So we got the phone call, went up and had a look. Within about 15 minutes of being in that warehouse, I could see there was about 35% more capacity in that warehouse. There is a very, very big gap between seeing 35% more capacity in a large warehouse, you know, nearly 40,000 SKUs, 55,000 locations, and then being able to get your arms around that 35% capacity and release it so that it can be used. So we actually got given the project to, to see whether that 35% could be captured. The long story short is, yes, it could. We did quite an extensive re-slotting process across the whole project. We found out that the bottleneck in the process was not actually the scale of the warehouse, but they had some significant problems in receiving and their put-away process. And over 10 years of evolution, those poor performing processes which needed to get re-engineered as the business evolved, but they didn't. So the poor old ant became the exoskeleton elephant and it had crumbled, which led to the thinking they needed a new warehouse. Reality was re-engineering gave them another five to seven years worth of life out of that particular facility. Now, it took 12 months from when we had finished designing the program of work required to release that 35% capacity and the reality is that we only got around 25 to 27% of it. You never can get everything theoretically from a space perspective. But nonetheless, we offset that multi tens of millions of dollar capex, and we got them another five to seven years worth of life out of their existing facility. We actually identified and fixed the core issue. And as a result of that, they were able to both create an environment where they could release some of their overflow labour requirements and also built in headroom to take on more business, which previously they didn't think was possible. So there's one simple case study within a, a brownfields environment. I guess from a greenfields environment, the case study we talked about earlier in working out where they want to be in the long-term future, working out how quickly we can get the infrastructure in place to move to that long-term future and then reverse engineering from that point in the near term when we've got our new toy, how do we get the business from today to that new infrastructure whilst maintaining the growth momentum needed to support the capex required to get into that new facility. And in relation to Greenfields, we've also got a new white paper, Rethinking Warehouse Design, which again can be downloaded from our website. And this is talking about that inside out design process. This amplifies that notion of sign nothing, until you've designed everything. And it also goes through that iterative design process with the warehouse designers, the architects, and the engineers. The other element within the white paper is a case study. And that case study shows very clearly the differences in outcomes that can be achieved by looking at different materials handling options against the building envelope required and the land requirement in those options, and then flows through to the headcount requirements within those different operations. And what that case study amplifies is that notion that you do need to design everything because you will see the highest CapEx options are actually the lowest ongoing OpEx options. And the difference is very, very significant. So that case study is also quite informative and in understanding how as you move one of the elements within this array of inputs, other elements also move around. And it's not until you know all of the outcomes of each of the elements, do you actually know what the bottom line is going to look like? Thank you, Peter. That's excellent. Well, that's two brilliant white papers on offer today. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for joining us today from Prological. Thank you, Sharon. It's been great to spend this time with you. And I hope those that interact with your podcast enjoy what we've been able to chat about today. At Prological, we are very passionate about supply chain. There's nothing more that we like than helping our clients with their end-to-end -end strategic supply chain transformation, be that domestic or international freight, network design, process re-engineering, automation. Energy and sustainability optimization is another one of the verticals that we have integrated into our next generation warehouse design. And it's fascinating the way that also then plays into transport options. And we'll see much more of that moving into the future. At Prological, we see ourselves as more than just consultants. We're collaborative game changers who deliver tailored, innovative and commercially astute and operationally sustainable supply chain solutions for our clients. We've got a long history of that. We really enjoy giving our clients 
that unfair advantage that we hope their competitors will be talking about for a long, long time. Excellent, Peter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon. Well, that concludes today's episode about automation and warehousing considerations in network design with Prological. You will find all their contact details listed below, including links to their brilliant white papers. So join us again at Supply Chain Partners TV and Podcast, where we meet with our expert members at Supply Chain Partners to discuss key business and supply chain topics, issues and trends, including logistics, supply chain management, technology and much more. We welcome you to subscribe to this Supply Chain Partners channel and we look forward to you joining us again in a future episode.